tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We know that there is more snow in the forecast and what this does is adds uh, weight to trees and branches. Here we go again, a messy mix of snow and rain as another winter storm hits the south coast. Plus, and that's all been taken away, so it means a lot to me. Seashelt sinkholes, dozens of residents forced out of their homes and... <laughs> I said, are you proposing? <laughs> <laughs> a Valentine's Day love story from a Surrey Senior Center. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. The south coast is being hit by yet another winter storm tonight. And it's making for a very messy Thursday commute home. The CBC's Tina Levgreen is live near Highway 1 in Surrey for us. And Tina, how's it looking out there? Well, I, I won't lie to you, it doesn't look great. Uh, it's dumping pretty hard here. The snow is coming down very hard. And I can tell you from driving here myself uh, that visibility is low. And all this during the rush hour commute. Uh, drivers being told to be careful out there that road conditions can change suddenly. Drive BC issued a travel advisory for the Coquihalla Highway and we're expecting to see anywhere from 5 to 10 centimeters of snow by tomorrow and that's on top of all the snow we've already got which is half a meter in some regions so more snow more problems. The weight of the snow is piling up bending trees some uncomfortably close to power lines now ready to snap. We know that there is more snow in the forecast and what this does is adds uh, weight to trees and branches which can potentially cause them to break and come into contact with our equipment which could result in some power outages. And you never know how long the outages will last. Customers should have an emergency kit with things like a flashlight, batteries, first aid kit, food and water. Snow is also piling up on roofs causing some to collapse or rip right off like this mobile home in Mission. In some cases, impossible to fix the damage right now. Safety concerns with the snow layered on so thick. And if it's not one thing, it's another. Temperatures will hover near the freezing mark overnight. The perfect recipe for pipes to burst. It's already happened here in Surrey. Unprotected irrigation pipe that wasn't drained. So with these bad temperatures that we're having, uh, it completely blew last night and sprayed water everywhere. The new homeowner didn't know the pipe valve wasn't shut off or built to code. We got all this water coming. It's like, how much damage it's going to do? It's good, you know, it's minus temperatures, and uh, uh, you would panic. You know, this may cost me thousands of dollars. So, thankfully, she got to it in time. There's a lot of water that flows through here, and it can potentially flood houses. Luckily, somebody was home and heard it. But imagine if you're away for the weekend and this happened, you can total a house really, really quickly. But as the cold snap persists, the service calls will increase. The damage is only expected to become more severe. So a reminder to um, winterize your home, especially if you have pipes that run outside or if you've newly renovated your house. And again, it is snowing pretty hard here in Surrey during the rush hour commute. We're expecting freezing rain overnight in Surrey, Langley, Chilliwack and Abbotsford. So treacherous road conditions and sidewalks. So be careful out there and drive safely. All right, pretty sloppy. Thanks, Tina. Whiteout conditions, sideways winds, and growing snowpacks are causing mass disruptions on Vancouver Island as well. Mm -hmm. Slick roads mean even professional drivers are getting into trouble. For safety reasons, many bus routes have been cancelled over the last five days. In Shawnigan, one bus found itself completely stuck, unable to move until snow plows dug it out. BC Transit says employees are now pulling double shifts, even sleeping at the bus depot to try to keep things running. Not only are there traction problems, but there's, uh, we're contending with the winds pushing the bus side to side. And uh, with the load of passengers, it's uh, sometimes a little bit nerve wracking. Drivers say under those conditions, schedules go out the window, with passenger safety being, of course, the priority.
And meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is here now. And Joe, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering how long this is going to last. Yes, and how much snow you'll end up with uh, by the end of it all. You can see that it is snowing here in downtown Vancouver as well. Not sticking to the surfaces yet here at uh, CBC, but I am getting reports of snow starting to accumulate across other parts of Vancouver, uh, Grandview and 33rd, North Surrey, Coquitlam. In fact, already hearing reports of three to five centimeters of fresh snow on the ground. It is a messy evening and snowfall totals will be variable. Uh, basically, it's been a battle between the Arctic air that moved in overnight and this new system pushing warm air from the south. And so far, the Arctic air is winning, so I do think we will see some significant accumulations uh, by tomorrow morning. Uh, let me show you the big picture out there right now. Uh, the radar, the blues are capturing where the snow is and the green is where the rain is, but I don't think this is doing a great job because Surrey down towards White Rock, uh, the radar is picking it up as rain, but I am hearing reports that it's more of a wet snow. At this point, I think everyone is getting more of a wet snow mix. We'll start to see things change over uh, after midnight. But again, the Arctic outflow seems to be winning, uh, and that's pushing those totals a little higher. That southward flow uh, could bring totals close to 15 centimeters, and Environment Canada has just upped that warning. It's quite a range, 5 to 15 centimeters. I'd expect those higher amounts inland at higher elevations and the valley, and as Tina mentioned, also watching for freezing rain there. So I'll time it out and talk about the break that we will get tomorrow afternoon coming up. All right, we'll see you soon. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. This weather update is brought to you by your local REMAX agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a REMAX agent. The man accused of groping a seven-year-old on SkyTrain has been arrested. Transit police circulated photos and video of the man captured the day of the alleged assault. Seven-year-old was riding transit with her mother when the man reportedly began making lewd comments towards her before allegedly touching her buttocks. The 57-year-old Burnaby resident turned himself in this morning. He's since been released with strict conditions. He's not to have contact with the victim or the victim's mother. He's not to be on SkyTrain and he's uh, to abstain from the consumption of alcohol. Officers are recommending charges of sexual interference. The man who has yet to be identified is slated to appear in Vancouver Provincial Court this April. Well, they are million dollar homes with stunning views of the Sunshine Coast. But tonight they are facing an evacuation order and the families who live there uncertain futures. As the CBC's Rafferty Baker reports from Seashelt, dangerous sinkholes are forcing residents to pack up and leave. This is our wine room. Um, we use it as a bedroom, of course, but right now it's a junk room. That's the stuff that we are leaving behind. Rod Goy walks through his dream retirement home, perhaps for the last time. He and his wife Donna are forced to evacuate and can't take everything. And about 200 bottles of wine aren't making the move. The Goys say the support they've had from the community has been amazing. But still, it's been a heart-wrenching experience. Everything that we worked for, worked hard for in our career, culminated in this area and this property and this home and our family and that's all been taken away so it means a lot to me i'll never forget this i'll never forgive the district of seashell for what they've done to us here residents blame the district of seashell in its handling of the sinkhole problem the district issued the building permits the mayor says the original permits were based on official stamped professional reports she says with future developments the district will do more around due diligence but over the course of the week since an evacuation advisory was issued, there's been no official support. Barriers put in place by the district have been moved aside by someone, letting trucks through to move everything out of the homes. I mean, I love my home. I love the view. I just, I love the community. It's, I didn't want to have to leave and I didn't want to have to, to go through all this. It's just, I don't know, I, I'm in shock. Problems with sinkholes go back years. One home has already been condemned, a sinkhole tearing the front steps apart. Some volunteers from the community and some professional movers are still working to clear out the final homes here behind me, the last of 14 homes to be completely cleared out. Tomorrow, the District of Seashell will issue an evacuation order and declare a local state of emergency. Our focus is on the safety of the residents and when we 
did the evacuation alert, we actually uh, were asked to put the order in place right away by the geotechnical firm, et cetera. We gave the residents a week because we wanted to give them some time to get their affairs in order to get their belongings out. Tomorrow, a fence will go up around the entire neighborhood. It's meant to keep out any intruders and the residents whose million dollar homes with stunning views of Seashelt Inlet may become worthless. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Seashelt. Well, you can get ready to pay more to power your home. Yes, the NDP says BC Hydro has not been well managed, and that means you are on the hook for an electricity rate increase. CBC's Provincial Affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher has the latest tonight from Victoria. Last spring, the NDP government announced a two-phase review of BC Hydro. Part one is now complete, and the province says it will pay off $1.1 billion in deferred costs in a bid to minimize rate spikes. Here's what you can expect on your bill. Hydro rates will go up a total of 8% over the next five years. The first rate hike would amount to 1.8% and would kick in April 1st. The next hike would come a year later at 0.7%, all of this hinging on approval from the regulator. BC's energy minister acknowledged her government had pledged to freeze hydro rates altogether, but claims these increases could have been worse. We were committed to finding the best possible reduction, as much reduction as we possibly could from the existing plan under the BC Liberals. And we have looked in every corner to find every penny that we can pinch. We have found that and we're able to reduce that rate increase by 40%. As part of this review, the government commissioned a report that found hydro customers are on the hook for $16 billion over the next two decades. The report blames the previous Liberal government for pressuring BC Hydro into signing contracts with independent power producers. BC Hydro bought too much energy, the wrong type of energy, and paid too much for it. But the opposition's current hydro critic casts doubt on how that report was commissioned in the first place. Minister Mongal and the NDP government, I think, clearly wanted a report to set, uh, to lay out a certain number of conditions, and uh, that's what they've done. These experts call it a very politically driven report. When you go back into the time period this report was covering, there was a need for new supplies of electricity. Well, I think they were trying to create an industry, an IPP industry, and I think there was heavy lobbying uh, to do that. Um, there's a lot of communities who like IPPs, I understand that, but uh, it has consequences. Also a big part of this review, the province says it will now be giving more power back to the BC Utilities Commission to oversee BC Hydro. It says to take the politics out of the decision making. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Victoria. An NDP MLA says he's asking the Conflict of Interest Commissioner if he should leave a committee reviewing ride hailing. The committee that wrote the original report uh, recommended ride hailing, recommended that we bring ride um, hailing legislation in, uh, support ride hailing, and, uh, and so I didn't think it would be an issue. Uh, but now that allegations have been raised, I have written to the commissioner to get advice. The Liberals say North Delta MLA Ravi Kalon is in a perceived conflict because his father has a taxi license. Kalon believes he's not conflicted and says his decisions on previous ride-hailing reports should indicate that. He says he served in good faith and expects to be cleared by the conflict commissioner. Hundreds of people marched through Vancouver's downtown east side today to pay respect to missing and murdered women. <laughs> Many carried pamphlets marked with a heart that contained the names of women who are missing or no longer alive. This is the 28th year the march has been held, and since its inception, organizers say they're still dealing with the same issues. We look at the elimination of violence against women, you know, where we are today compared to 30 years ago, you know, and a whole lot hasn't changed. There's a lot of, there's a lot of words and there's a lot of lip service, but we need changes today. Organizers say a number of systemic changes need to be made to protect Indigenous women who still suffer discrimination and racism. Well, Mike, it's Valentine's Day. Yes, it is. We've accessorized with the... We have. Tie, yes. Hopefully Johanna got the memo when she comes in. <laughs> I hope she did. There's a lot of chocolate in here today, brownies and cake yeah. and, and chocolates, of course. Yeah, yeah. it's the way you celebrate Love Valentine's Day, I guess. Yeah. Love in the air all over the province. <laughs> and in honor of Valentine's Day, Jesse Johnston has a love story that takes place in a somewhat unusual setting. 
There's something about snow on Valentine's Day that makes everything look a little more romantic. And if it's romance you're after, what better place to look than here? 82-year-old Lauren Latham throw this in, throw that in. knows the Valentine's Day gift he's making has to be perfect because he's giving it to the perfect Valentine. <laughs> And as it turns out, his perfect valentine is picky. It's a bit skimpy, but... <laughs> They've been laughing since they met at the Newton Senior Center in 2002. Over time, their friendship blossomed into a romance, and then in 2012, Lauren finally popped the question. Well, kind of. Lauren was busy with his computer, and I said, what are you doing? He said, it's so hard to find a marriage commissioner around here. <laughs> <laughs> I said, are you proposing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I am. The staff here say Lauren and Nora's love story is rare. Cupid's arrow doesn't strike the Newton Senior Center very often, but many friendships are born here. If you're new to the community, new to retirement, um, or just seeking um, a greater social network, this is a great place. Finding a greater social network is what Nora and Lauren came here for. But what they both found was someone who can make them laugh for the rest of their lives. Cute. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Surrey. <laughs> you never know where you're going to find love. I love that story. Very cute couple. Very nice, very nice. And if you would like to watch that story again or share it, you can find it on all of our social media platforms. Search CBC Vancouver on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. And follow us on Twitter at CBC News BC. Yes, you can also watch this show streaming live and on demand every day without commercials. Just visit us on what the website, cbc.ca slash BC, or tune in on Facebook and YouTube. Well, they're heading to Ottawa from Alberta, desperate because of the downturn in the oil industry. Coming up, the other messages these protesters are bringing to Parliament Hill. Not only is it Valentine's Day, it's also Throwback Thursday. So, of course, we're combining the two. And tonight, we are taking you back to 2007. Yes, that's when a Canadian author put out a book offering tips on finding mm. Mr. Right. So we sent our Deborah Goble out to put his advice to the test. So it's February 14th. There you sit, alone, no flowers, no candy and up pops some self-help book author pontificating on the plight of single women everywhere. I think there are lots of great men out there and great women out there who would be perfect together if they could just find a way to meet. But take that to the street and you find that's a mighty big if. It's very hard yeah. nowadays. I think it's always hard to find a good guy. Yeah. They're all stupid. It's almost impossible. Because you're either gay or they're taken. <laughs> <laughs> Never fear, says J.M. Cairns, Ph.D. in the philosophy of perception, Nashville music producer and former loser in love. Mr. Wright is looking for you, and he's out there looking for you, and he's if he's not finding you, it's maybe because he needs a little help from you. Yeah, I guess so. All guys need a little help, I think. <laughs> and there she is. And don't worry what you look like. After all, if one man is the Pamela Anderson type and the next calls Jennifer Aniston his dream girl, there's probably somebody for you. I don't think attraction is an objective quality. I mean, really? one man's most attractive woman is another man's least attractive woman. I think women, though, think that men only like a certain type? I, th I think sometimes some women do think that. They think they have to be something that they're not in order to find the right guy, but you're not going to find the right one that way. You're going to find the wrong one. <laughs> And how do you find the right one? Take a risk. When women are in a group of women in a bar, it's much less likely that they're going to get approached by most guys because nobody likes being reviewed by a committee. Would you ever sit in a bar by yourself? Uh, yeah, definitely. I have and I will. And yeah. Don't worry what people think. No. No. <laughs> So take that destiny into your own hands. We're talking here about meeting the most important person in your life. Why should it be in any way embarrassing that, that you're actually making an effort to do that? And who knows? 
Maybe next year you'll be sitting there smelling the roses and eating the chocolates out of the hand of Mr. Wright. Well, Nobody. it could happen. I hate Valentine's Day. <laughs> I really do. Deborah Goble, CBC News, Vancouver. Would have been nice to hear from some guys, maybe, in the story, apart from the author. Oh, yeah, I guess we didn't really. No, we didn't. Well, mm, funny that. <laughs> and this was, of course, before the time of Tinder and Bumble and yeah. whatever all those apps are that neither of us. Because they've exploded since 2007. Yeah. Done, for sure. Okay, we're going to have more on what's making news across the country in just a few minutes. unusual protest is on its way to Ottawa from the heart of Alberta oil country. It's a convoy of trucks driven by people who say they're getting desperate because of the downturn in the oil industry. As the CBC's Rafi Bujikanian reports, he was there today when the group began its journey. Lord, I pray that oil would, uh, Lord, oil would flow through Alberta, would flow through Canada, God. The list of asks to a higher power is short. The list of grievances to the powers that be a little longer and a long time coming. Organizers started plotting the convoy's course to Ottawa weeks ago. Today, they were finally ready to set off. We got natural gas, we got oil, we're selling it for nothing. That's got to change. United We Rule wants pipelines built fast. It's also got issues with the federal Liberals' plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have to pay carbon tax on our bread, on our gas. And the group has managed to attract some who don't work in the oil industry, too. Ralph Sinclair's auto parts store serves clients in the energy sector. He's been suffering since the downturn five years ago. Uh, in 2014, we ended up having to lay off uh, six people. But even before setting out, this convoy has veered into controversial territory. Some of its members identify with the Yellow Vest movement, which has staged several protests across Western Canada this winter. Some see their message as anti-immigration. We're not against immigration, legal immigration. Some pro-oil groups have distanced themselves from the Yellow Vests. But in this convoy, anyone can come along for the ride as long as they don't make hateful statements. And so, with 3,500 kilometers to cover, they're finally off. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Red Deer, Alberta. Meanwhile, next door in Saskatchewan, the provincial government is fighting the federal government's plans to put a price on carbon emissions. As Bonnie Allen tells us, the feds are pushing back. Please rise. A courtroom packed with dozens of lawyers from across the country. Cameras rolling, making legal history. My lord, my ladies. It's a constitutional fight over greenhouse gas emissions and who has the authority to regulate them. One province's refusal or failure to sufficiently regulate greenhouse gas emissions impacts Canada as a whole. The federal government argues that Ottawa has the constitutional authority to impose a price on carbon, that cumulative greenhouse gas emissions qualify as a matter of national concern under the Peace Order and Good Government Clause. Saskatchewan, Ontario and New Brunswick made arguments yesterday that this would grant Ottawa sweeping powers and be a slippery slope to more federal regulation. It only begins here. It's also disrespectful to the sovereign authority of the provinces. Law professor Amir Adaran is intervening on behalf of a remote northern First Nation. It's a very fear-filled argument that Saskatchewan is making, um, but it's ultimately very weak. Ten interveners sided with Ottawa, representing First Nations, health professionals and environmental groups, some calling climate change a national emergency. Halifax is in jeopardy, Victoria is in jeopardy, in those circumstances, it is clear that the federal government has to intervene to save the nation from disaster. The Court of Appeal judges are expected to deliver a decision in the next few months. I think that the federal government probably will win this one, but I wouldn't bet your mortgage on it. Most involved expect the losing side to take this to the Supreme Court. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Well, another round of brutal winter has hit us now and snow is falling in some parts of Metro Vancouver and the island. After the break, we check in with Dan Burrett at Main Street and East 4th.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I'll never forgive the District of Seashell for what they've done to us here. Dozens of residents in Seashelt have been forced from their homes by dangerous sinkholes. An evacuation order and local state of emergency are in effect. We have looked in every corner to find every penny that we can pinch. Get ready to pay more for electricity. BC hydro rates are going up by 8% over the next five years if approved, which translates to about 200 a year more per household. The NDP is blaming the former Liberal government for high debt levels at the utility. Another winter storm is starting to pound the south coast and with a weather warning in place for much of Metro Vancouver and the islands. Yeah, our Dan Burrett joins us now live from Main Street and East 4th. Dan, it looks like it's uh, coming down pretty good there. Pretty sloppy, though. <laughs> Anita, Mike. Other than a snowfall, the third in as many days, a Justin Timberlake concert and people trying to get to Valentine's Day dinner, there's nothing happening in Metro Vancouver. And yes, it's sloppy out here. We've seen the requisite, it must be at least five or six people, and they're still walking along the street just down here, who have been, who have been holding the umbrellas out. We've people, seen people on a bike. In fact, and if you come over here just a little bit, you can see the tracks down here of a woman who was in a walker taking her time. She said she didn't want to get stuck in her house, but she had to be careful. She just guided herself along here. We've seen uh, close to an accident just out here. Obviously, it's, this is a busy street at the best of times, but when you add the snow and all those layers of ice, etc., it becomes even busier. We've seen the plows out and lots of buses just down here that normally come in, and they usually come in in waves. A lot of them are saying, sorry, bus full. And you see people crammed in there like sardines. We've been hearing from Johanna about whether or not this is going to be rain or whether or not this is going to be snow. It's wet snow right now. You can feel it just kind of getting into that, into your bones, that, that west coast wet snow. So again, still have to wait a several hours before this might even let up. And again, we're watching to see how many people are going to be braving the elements, and especially if you have a Valentine's Day reservation, let's hope the restaurant's flexible about what time you show up. Anita, Mike? Well, we know you don't have one. You're hosting the 11 tonight, so <laughs> get back here, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And just coming up on 6.30 on this Thursday evening, there's a live look at downtown Vancouver, Georgia Street, snow coming down. As Johanna said it would, and as we just saw with Dan, the south coast getting hit by another winter storm. It's messy, it's sloppy. Johanna's forecast is next.
Okay, depending on your view, today is either a day for love or a day just uh, for making money for holiday companies. <laughs> oh, cynical, oh, yes. No. I'm not saying that's my view, I'm just saying some people have some that people view. Say, yeah, enough. Yeah. Well, take a look at these sea otters. It's the first one for them. Definitely. Oh man. First snowballs, now hearts. These guys love are it. stealing our hearts. This I is love you acquired. like no yeah, right. otter. I love you like no otter. Oh yeah. That's, oh man. That's really bad. Very cute. <laughs> yeah. What are they eating? Oh. Uh, and a bit of a mysterious Valentine's Day tradition in Cumberland over on the island. Red hearts suddenly show up every year on the walls of businesses, <laughs> telephone poles, doorways, windows. I wonder who's doing that. And then they completely disappear the next day. Nice, a little bit of festiveness in the air. Exactly. Oh, and they've got little messages yeah. on them. Somebody messages put a lot of positivity. Time in that. Yeah, the otters are, are really getting us through this week. They I are. Feel like they're getting yeah. us through the snow, the cynical Valentine's yeah. Day. What are they going to do tomorrow? There's it's the Valentine's yeah. Day hangover tomorrow, so yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll find out rest. what Let their food rest. of choice is. <laughs> it's Friday. We can get through this on one on our own exactly. without the otters. Yeah. yeah. Can we get through the snow, though? Oh, boy. <laughs> I can. Mm. It's pretty wild. We're, we are talking our third accumulating snow event. This one, though, as we've heard from Tina and Dan, uh, so much wetter, mm -hmm. and that comes with all these other challenges. Let's see uh, what's happening on our streets of downtown Vancouver right now. So not quite sticking here yet. I am getting a ton of great snow reports, and this is what we call a now casting event because it is so tricky to nail down who is getting what and at what time. I do feel more and more confident, though, that most of Metro Vancouver and the island will end up with some kind of accumulations by tomorrow morning. So I just want to pause the radar right now, which actually isn't doing a great job of showing you what's going on where where we've got the green uh, it isn't necessarily coming down as rain uh, the profile through the atmosphere isn't uh, all consistent because we've got that warm air sliding in from the south colliding with that arctic air so even though the radar is picking up uh, rain at higher elevations it is sticking as snow for some sections so i've actually put on all of the snow reports i've received just in the past hour uh, downtown vancouver uh, as we head down towards uh, uh, marpole region metro town seen some accumulations North Delta, White Rock, now a couple centimeters on the ground. And then as we head out towards uh, Maple Ridge and Abbotsford, a couple centimeters already accumulated. Uh, your reports are so helpful uh, with these now casting events. If you're sending them on Twitter or Instagram, uh, us meteorologists use hashtag BC Storm uh, to share your reports and pictures. So keep them coming through the night and uh, that'll help us determine how quickly that changeover to rain is happening. So the center of the low is hanging off coast. That's what's bringing that mild push from the south. But you probably noticed that Arctic air that uh, moved in this morning, minus seven at Victoria and uh, minus five at uh, Vancouver Airport. So that so far is winning out over the milder air from the south. We have those snowfall warnings in place. And I do think we could end up with close to 15 centimeters for parts of Metro Vancouver. Pausing you uh, late this evening, we'll see that rain line sneak upwards as that warm air starts to move in, but still looking at accumulations possible right through to tomorrow morning. And not everyone will get the same amount. That's why the range is quite large, a 2 to 15 centimeter event for Metro Vancouver by tomorrow evening though. In fact, by the afternoon hours, the warm air will finally win out and we'll see that snow tomorrow morning change over to rain for most of Metro Vancouver. The exception is out towards the Fraser Valley where we are looking at that risk for freezing rain tonight, tomorrow morning, and even into tomorrow afternoon. That's showing up in the pink and that line will move back and forth. So heads up, slippery conditions possible in the Fraser Valley. But tomorrow evening, we will see this system begin to ease and again, change over to rain for most of Metro Vancouver. Let me take you through the long range though. A lot to get through. Starting with the storm tonight, again, tomorrow morning commute, you're going to want to leave a lot of extra time, uh, check the roads, check schools. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some closures and bus cancellations. Temperatures are warm enough over the weekend that we, if we see any lingering rounds of precip through the day, it'll be rain. But then check out early next week. Our seasonals for this time of the year are up around 7 or 8 degrees, and I am still seeing this Arctic air mass stick around I got to say it, I don't think we're done with the snow yet. It mm. feels like it's never ending. Every day you, it gets another one and another one and another February one. 2019. It's going to be one we're going to talk about for a while. We already are. <laughs> we already are. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. This weather update is brought to you by Remax. What's your home worth?
Find out with our instant valuation tool at Remax.ca. Sting sends out an SOS for workers at the General Motors plant in Oshawa. The musician stages a special performance for those about to lose their jobs. That's coming up. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver's Anita Bath as she hosts the 20th anniversary of the Influential Women in Business Awards on March 8th. And celebrate International Women's Day with Gloria Makarenko at West Coast Leafs Equality Breakfast. Get your tickets today. And for more on these events, you can check us out online, cbc.ca slash bc. So the growing SNC-Lavalin controversy now, and it's by no means a certainty, but a fraud and corruption conviction would bar the company from bidding on federal work for a ten, full 10 years. Giant Quebec-based engineering firm says it has $8 billion worth of construction projects planned right now. As Allison Northcott reports, the stakes for a company with 50,000 employees worldwide are high. Just take a look at the Montreal skyline and you'll see SNC-Lavalin's work everywhere. The roof of the Olympic Stadium, the Mercier Bridge, the soon-to-be-completed Champlain Bridge. The engineering giant also owns part of the 407 toll highway near Toronto and built part of the SkyTrain system in Vancouver. The company's long history here, started by Francophone Quebecers, is a particular source of pride, with major projects like the Manic 5 Dam and the James Bay Hydroelectric Project. But there have been scandals, too. Allegations of fraud and bribery, including a bid-rigging scheme to build this $1.3 billion Montreal hospital. This is an important player in the Quebec economy and in the Canadian economy. This Quebec radio host and political watcher says despite SNC-Lavalin's past problems with corruption, it remains an important economic driver. It's also uh, a success story, a major employer, a major 
partner in economic development. Uh, we don't have that many multinational co uh, companies that have a head office in Quebec. And uh, the, the vast majority of the people who work there had nothing to do with corruption. It's why many Quebec pundits and politicians want the Trudeau government to allow the company to be sanctioned out of court. I'm not asking him not to punish, uh, punish uh, SNC-Lavalin. I'm just trying to say, can you settle as soon as possible in order that we keep the jobs? This columnist says giving the company a deal is not about pandering to Quebec, but about good public policy. The narrative seems to be that, uh, oh, here's another uh, Quebec uh, company involved in some corruption scheme and uh, that asks for you know the charity of, for the, uh, from the government and to uh, uh, to be saved and then uh, the government seems to be uh, trying to buy votes in Quebec Quebec's pension fund is SNC Lavalin's largest shareholder giving Quebecers a vested interest even if those shares are a small fraction of its holdings very good company the best that I work with and uh, Whatever's happening with them, it's only a few rotten apples. And it's why many here hope those few won't lead to everyone paying a price. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. A high school teacher has been found guilty of voyeurism after secretly filming some of his students that are female. Olivia Stefanovic has more now on this landmark ruling by the Supreme Court of Canada. In a unanimous decision, nine Supreme Court judges agree students don't give up their privacy rights when they're at school, even though it's a public space. At issue in this case was whether 27 female students aged 14 to 18 had a reasonable expectation of privacy in their classrooms and hallways when their London, Ontario teacher, Ryan Jarvis, used a so-called spy pen to secretly film their faces, chests and cleavage areas. The original court judge found Jarvis violated the students' rights, but wasn't satisfied the videotapes were made for a sexual purpose. Jarvis was acquitted. The Crown appealed. The Ontario Court of Appeal found Jarvis did act with sexual intent, but still upheld his acquittal, arguing the students had no reasonable expectation of privacy at school, pointing to the presence of 24-hour surveillance cameras. Today, the top court quashed that decision, and many privacy experts are celebrating. I think it's a really important decision for Canadians' privacy rights going forward, uh, in particular because the court, um, again, rejects uh, in very clear terms the idea that being in a so-called public space somehow should be interpreted as a waiver of one's uh, privacy. But others are concerned. Jarvis's lawyers released a statement calling the ruling troubling saying it casts the criminal bar too wide. Everyone can agree that the ruling has far-reaching implications. How they are interpreted going forward remains to be seen. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. The woman who draped herself in an ISIS banner and attacked workers at a Canadian tire store in Toronto has been sentenced to seven years in prison. Last month, Rahab Dugmosh was found guilty of four terrorism-related charges. In the June 2017 attack, she used a golf club and a butcher's knife as she yelled, God is great, in Arabic. Three of her charges stem from that incident. She was also convicted for trying to travel to Syria to join ISIS. The judge in this case cited mental illness in the sentencing, but says it does not absolve her of responsibility. Well, rocker Sting took to the stage today in Oshawa with a song and a message to General Motors playing for free for GM workers who are facing mass layoffs. As Ali Chason shows us, the former police frontman says he understands what the workers are going through. A message in the GM workers are feeling very seen right now. Selling out an SOS. Keep going. The reason we're here is we want to show our support and solidarity for your cause here. Sting is here with the cast of his new musical, The Last Ship. You've got the last Inspired by his experience growing up in a shipbuilding town in northeast England. But that industry dissolved, and so did the community's economy, identity, 
In character, ladies and gentlemen, Stink. Well, I say this. I do not consent. It's not the story of us being expendable. It's the story of, of us being unstoppable. When you think about the, the actual the show itself, it gets right to the throat and the heart of what's going on in the city today. It's got to be pretty powerful to hear him sing this song right now for you guys. Absolutely, absolutely. It is powerful, and uh, I'm glad I attended. What do you say? This is exactly the kind of attention the union representing the GM workers wants to keep the story of the plant closure in the news. Thank you so much for being here today, Francis, Joe. What an honor, what an honor and a privilege. Thanks, Thank you. Jimmy. Thank you. I think you, you have a, a duty to support the community that's worked for you. And um, it's, it's a mutual, it should be a mutual support system. Eleven weeks ago, GM announced the Oshawa plant will close by the end of the year. Sting can't change that, admittedly. We are telling your story, and it's important that your story is heard. This can't be buried under the political carpet. Everyone knew in the industry that was in the plans a few years uh, ago to make, you know, to close down. What we're doing, we're, we're reaching out to the GM workers to make sure they get retrained and they find good paying jobs. Today's Sting performance was a welcome distraction. I haven't seen Sting in a long time since uh, in the days of the police. I'm a president of my local, um, so I was able to take a holiday day and come up and enjoy, enjoy a moment of this. To sway to the music of the last ship, all the day the last car is made in Oshawa, looms. Ali Chias on CBC News, Oshawa. Well, if there's a single issue that symbolizes Donald Trump's bond with his base, it's his wall along the U.S.-Mexican border. But today, Congress has again refused to give the U.S. president the money he needs to build it. Ellen Morrow has more. He's prepared to sign the bill. He will also be issuing a national emergency declaration at the same time. With that confirmation, President Trump is declaring a national emergency, freeing up funding for a border wall that was supposed to be paid for by Mexico. They're going to pay for the wall and they're going to enjoy it, okay? They're going to enjoy it. Unsurprisingly, immediate criticism. Declaring a national emergency would be a lawless act, a gross abuse of the power of the presidency. Trump was asking for $5.7 billion for the wall. The bill from Congress today gave him just a fraction of that. So the president is taking matters into his own hands, sidestepping Congress and its constitutional control over spending. Nancy Pelosi asked Republicans how they'd like it if a Democrat did the same thing. So if the president can declare an emergency on something that he has created as an emergency, an, an, an illusion that he wants to convey, just think of what a president with different values can present to the American people. It's a concern Republicans are heeding. In a statement Marco Rubio wrote, no crisis justifies violating the Constitution. Today's national emergency is border security, but a future president may use this exact same tactic to impose the Green New Deal. Trump, too, once opposed the same tactics. In this 2014 tweet, writing Republicans must not allow President Obama to subvert the Constitution of the U.S. for his own benefit and because he is unable to negotiate with Congress. The president, though, has some backing. Senator Lindsey Graham tweeted, I stand firmly behind President Trump's decision to use executive powers to build the wall, barriers we desperately need. The declaration does not mean the wall is a done deal. Democrats will fight it in Congress and lawsuits could be filed. Cases that could end up at the Supreme Court. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Well, despite a growing opposition movement and international pressure, Nicolas Maduro is holding on to power as leader of Venezuela. One reason is his control of the military. Maduro has been showcasing his support from the armed forces in recent weeks, but as the CBC's Adrian Arsenault reports, support among ordinary soldiers may not be as strong as it appears. Come on, Eva. A Venezuelan soldier who is furious, angry enough to talk, and he knows the risk of what he's doing. If they find me doing this, they're going to charge me with treason to the nation. 
and the consequences for that are torture. So he is tempting torture to say this, that if he's given orders to shoot on crowds, he won't do it. I'm incapable of opening fire on my own people. Even my own family could be there. I'm incapable of hurting them. And my companions, I'd say that for the great majority would do the same. I don't think any of them would be capable of gunning down people who can defend themselves. The restraint of some soldiers has been a frequent conversation in Venezuela lately, especially with remarkable scenes recently of National Guardsmen getting hugs from protesters. Ever determined to show the military is on his side, Nicolas Maduro's public relations efforts have been heavily focused on showing his closeness to the military. Last week, even getting a medal pinned to him. Although, listen carefully to the exchange with the soldier. With or without blood, he jests. Perhaps not so much of a joke. If Maduro fears some sort of insurrection, then this soldier may understand why. <laughs> they know they're losing. They know they have no way to control this. They know that people don't believe in their lies anymore. They know that the armed forces are split and that a large number support Juan Guaido. His complaints, he says, are like those of so many others in the country. Not enough money to feed the families, not enough security or promise. That may be so for many of the rank and file, but they take orders from the upper echelons of the forces. And those are people protected by Maduro's government. They live happily. They live in three-story houses. They have all the luxuries. They get a hold of all the things you can't get in this country. They have access to everything, everything. Everything from food, medicine, private clinics, doctors. They travel. Even so, bottom line, can Nicolas Maduro count on the armed forces to protect him and his government? One man's view. The government can depend on the armed forces. If it's a good government, if it's a fair government, if it's an honorable government. But this government, like this now, can't count on the armed forces. He says that and yet knows his risky to articulate analysis may amount to nothing. There have been a lot of bold statements about and by the opposition in Venezuela over the last month, and yet Nicolas Maduro remains, his grip remains. The story of the opposition is so far just one of words, not many deeds. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Caracas. Well, along with many of us, the Calgary Zoo marked Valentine's Day today. Coming up, we'll show you what kind of gifts the animals were given.
with it being Valentine's Day, some lucky folks, or unlucky if you don't like receiving flowers from your significant other, received flowers. This is not going in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> if you receive flowers tonight, you are in good company. Yes. How about that? Take a look at this. <laughs> at the Calgary Zoo, some of the animals were gifted roses from the oh, zoo staff. Oh, that's I nice. bet that's exactly how you all handled your roses when you were given them. You ate them. Yes. Yeah, for uh, sure. Even though the pandas and penguins tended uh, to think of the flowers as, yeah, well, it's a snack, right? <laughs> I'm eating my gift. Very good. There you Aww. go. I mean, some flowers are edible. I've seen some totally. great salads. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, on a day like today, putting them in a vase is not a bad idea. There's no shortage of love songs. Okay, this is a, a <laughs> debater to express your emotions this Valentine's Day. But with so many to choose from, what's the perfect tune to play for your partner? Well, the CBC held an unofficial poll on Twitter to find the best Canadian love song. Ooh. So it eventually came down to two titans, Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On, although I'm not sure that's exactly a love song, and Brian Adams' Everything I Do, I Do It For You. And the winner, drum roll. Yes. Oh, that was. I hope, your mic, was, I hope Adams, your mic was on for that and he's singing along. I don't know if it was. This would, of course, <laughs> suggest that yes, indeed, Brian Adams did come out on top with 56% of the vote. On its way to the top, it had to beat out some uh, pretty tough uh, competition, including Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe, You're Still the One by Shania Aww. Twain, and Dance Me to the End of Love. Beautiful song by the late uh, Leonard Cohen. I mean, is Call Me Maybe really tough competition? I don't know. I've, I am so happy with Brian Adams winning. Yeah. That's a great song. I'm I mean, the, yeah, I, I, how, how do you guys I, feel I about that? I would have gone Adams? with Shania, You're Still the One, or a different Celine Dion song. She has many wonderful love songs. Such controversy Such on a controversy. day when we're supposed yeah, to. Can we just if get If you need off? some playlist <laughs> ideas, you can put them all into one. Yes. yes. Okay. Brian Adams, though. That's good. Gets me every it's time. Good. You can't go wrong with Brian Adams. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Dan Bird is here at 11 o'clock with your next local news. Have a wonderful night. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day.